As promised, a brief reaction video to the Piers Morgan interview with the Ingram Moore family regarding the Captain Tom Foundation. I will link that interview in the description below so you can watch it in full yourself to form your own opinions and conclusions and you don't have to rely on my opinions throughout this video. I have to say, whilst I'm not going to be overly critical in this video, that's not neither necessary nor deserved, but I have to say that there are still some questions that remain outstanding in my mind and some suggestions of answers to some of those questions through that interview, which some of you may not be happy about. Um, I'm going to link you to, uh, or sh rather show you, a few bits of information online uh, which may allow you to draw your own views so that you've got uh, e easier access via me and this channel to some of this information. Now, first of all, one or two of the questions that many of you might be thinking about. Um, let's just start with a random one about the £18,000 that was paid for the Virgin O2 awards ceremony. Many people might question as to whether or not um, that money should have been paid at all um, if Hannah Ingram Moore was indeed paid the CEO salary at that time. Her argument being that they had no idea whether or not they were going to be paid um, for beyond the three-month um, appointment duration. Uh, obviously, it was a pro rata, so it wasn't uh, an ongoing annual thing. It was in three-month chunks. So some people may feel that that's justified that they took that fee. Uh, for attending that ceremony. Um, that is best left to your own judgment. Um, the CEO's salary itself, this would have been authorised by the Charity Commission because the Charity Commission needs to look at any uh, applications like this where there may be a potential conflict of interest. There was clearly um, the potential for a conflict of interest in this situation. And so I don't think it should be held against them in that respect because there are mechanisms to prevent such conflicts of interest and that would have been looked at in great detail. Although Piers Morgan did phrase the questions around her experience in running any charity uh, while she said she was not without knowledge going into the role. And so some may argue that she was best placed having the best knowledge of uh, Captain Tom and some commercial knowledge previously and therefore uh, was well placed to suit that role. So overall, I don't think there's a, a, an over, overly critical view one could draw of that. I think uh, ultimately from the interview, most people will be, as I mentioned in my previous videos, will be drawing some criticism surrounding the sale of the books. Now, the timing is key here, because if I bring you over to a screen share and show you this is the Captain Tom Foundation on the Register of Charities for the Charity Commission. As you can see there, there is a regulatory alert here. That's because the um, commission has an ongoing investigation. Now, the charities run it very much like a company, but obviously it is for charitable causes and there is a fiduciary duty involved. More about that in another video, which I'll also link in the description below as to when a charity is supposed to be registered vis-a-vis -vis turnover and that kind of thing. If you're interested in that, I've done a lengthy video on that. I'll link that in the description below as well. Um, but much like a company, they have a memorandum, an article of association and of incorporation. Um, and in this sense, um, it was incorporated on the 5th of May, 2020. Um, and then later amended and so on, and outlines what the charitable objects of the charity are, um, particularly relief of sickness, disease, etc. So all things to do with health and well-being. The reason I say the dates are important here is that all of this happened in May 2020. Now, the eventually after the break in the interview, where the family said that they were going to refuse filming if they um, or refused the interview if they carried on filming and instead discussed it off air, off record, but then came back on camera, back on record to uh, discuss where the revenue came from, um, this 800 odd thousand pounds. Now, as I mentioned in my previous video, um, that it was to do with these books and that many people might have questions over that. Those questions in my mind are what remain outstanding for reasons that I will explain now. So the intellectual property, the IP, now if I just break from this story for a moment to give you a brief overview of how some companies work, perfectly legitimately by the way, but some companies do work by 
uh, registering the intellectual property. That could be trademarks, that could be copyright, it could be patents. Um, they can be registered in a company and owned by a company, but used by another company or somebody else. And so the beneficiaries of those uh, intellectual property collectively um, could, could be one company or could be individuals and so on. So just because um, another company might be marketing and using a, let's say, a trademark, the company that owns the rights to that trademark ultimately can derive the benefit. They can license it, they can give permissions to use it, and so on. And so in that sense, um, with that very briefest of understanding uh, of intellectual property, we move to Club Nook Limited, which was the family business, and the trademarks that have been registered with the Intellectual Property Office. Now, there were um, this, you, you'll see here, just to explain what might look confusing, there are a number of different client IDs listed here. It's all the same company, but it just means that when it was registered with the Intellectual Property Office, for whatever reason, they were not put under the same client ID. Um, that can happen just by the different filings and so on, but ultimately it's the same company. So just in case that looks confusing. So whilst there's a number of different client IDs here, um, most of these have one trademark registered, but one of them has multiple trademarks registered. So if we move to the next tab here, this first client ID, so all the same company, remember, but this first client ID, which was um, the client ID registered with the IPO, has six trademarks registered. Uh, those being word text marks of Captain Tom, Sir Tom Moore, Captain Sir Tom, Sir Tom Moore, Captain Sir Tom, and Captain Tom. And if you go into each and every one of these, it will show you what is protected. Now, again, for the briefest of explanations as to what a trademark is and how it protects certain things, let's say that you have a trademark and you want to sell bottled water. That would obviously be very different, let's say, from legal services. So one company might have a name, um, let's call it um, Clearview. Apologies, Clearview, if there is a Clearview out there watching this, um, but it's just a random example. Let's say we've got Clearview selling bottled water, but we also have Clearview providing legal services. They are very different markets. So because they are different markets, then there is not going to be a conflict automatically unless one or the other has decided to, let's say the law firm decided to cover bottled water for whatever reason. But otherwise, because they are completely different markets, there's not automatically an infringement. So the bottled water company is not automatically infringing on the law firm because it's not providing legal services and vice versa. Those are called classes. So when we go back to the registrations here, each class will de determine what is protected under the use of that trademark. And so when we go to this one particular trademark, uh, if you look at the overview, this is um, this one here ending 1030, which is Captain Tom. So Captain Tom has been protected under the following list of goods or services. And these under class 9, class 16, and within each class, the class is a broad uh, spectrum of areas of, of different markets and within each of those classes you can specify precisely, more precisely, what is protected. So class 9, uh, they have specifically protected any digital recorded media, DVDs, CDs, electronics and so on. Under class 16, this covers things such as printed matter, paper books, calendars, stationery, greetings cards, diaries, so merchandise, memorabilia, class 21, so this is now onto physical things, mugs, drinks, containers, water bottles. Um, class 25 would be clothing. So if, if you were registering a trademark only to protect clothing brands, then you might only use class 25, for example. But if you wanted to encompass anything like mugs or whatever, you would need two different classes. So each of these different classes, 26, ornamental badges, and so on, class 30, um, beverages, tea, and so on. Um, and then we come to class 36, which is arranging charitable fundraising activities, class 41, arranging conductive cultural events and uh, whatever for charitable purposes. So a very wide spectrum of protection for that particular trademark, Captain Tom. And when you look into each of the others as well, 
you will then see list of goods and services. And sure enough, you see a very similar spectrum of classes protected. Now, in each of the other trademark uh, IDs that you can see, as you can see here, there's only one mark listed for each of these. Um, but this was Captain Tom Moore. Then you look at another one. Walk with Tom, Colonel Tom, Colonel Tom Moore, and tomorrow will be a good day. That was the title of the autobiography. So the issue here is that all of the intellectual property, all of these trademarks were registered in the name of Club Nook, which was the family business. Now, the issue that a lot of people will probably maintain is that because of the timing, um, if you remember, if we go back to the, the screenshot here, if we go back to one of these, you can see that the registration date of all of, well, most of these is in or around May. So remembering that the uh, charity was incorporated on the 5th of May, these were filed some weeks later. Uh, some of them later on in August that year, but most of which registered in the same month. So all set up at the same time. Now, the natural logical argument would be that the intellectual property should have all been registered in the name of the charity and for the charity because that's what the charity was set up for. Now, the counter argument is that, of course, he might have wanted to help the family, to earn some money for the family and so on. But the counter argument to that is that none of these books would likely, with all respect, have sold very many had it not been for the charitable causes and the publication and the media coverage that that received because of the charitable uh, efforts. And so, in other words, the books wouldn't have been sold and the money wouldn't have been raised for the sale of those books had it not been for publicising the uh, charitable efforts. However, because all of the intellectual property was registered to the company, legally at this moment, from that moment forward, the money raised from the sale of the books, the IP uh, licensed or however it was set up in the contracts would all come back to Club Nook Limited, which was the family business. Now, many people might argue as to whether or not that was fair, whether it was right. Now, there is a mechanism in law of what we call bad faith. Now, I'm not saying for a moment that these were registered in bad faith. Um, that is not for me to decide. Um, but many people ask the question, so this is how it might be determined if that question were raised. Now, a trademark registered in bad faith, let's say, for example, I were to register a trademark that broadly resembled Tesco. And my purpose with it was to make money off the back of the goodwill that they've generated with their existing business. And I'm trying to do the same with a new mark. Well, obviously, that would be in bad faith. Now, there are a number of different cases that have talked about bad faith. So to give you one example, again, if we move to a um, legal resource here, which is uh, Westlaw, um, obviously reproduced here only for educational purposes. Um, this is a judgment of the Court of Justice. So this is a European case. Um, one of the uh, paragraphs here discussing bad faith here uh, provides that um, where the proprietor of a trademark has filed the application for registration of that mark, not with the aim of engaging fairly in competition, but with intention of undermining in a manner inconsistent with honest practices, uh, the interest of third parties or with the intention of obtaining without even targeting a specific third party an exclusive right for purposes other than those falling in with the, within the functions of the trademark. Now again, as I say, I'm not for a moment suggesting that any of these were registered in bad faith, but it does raise the question to me as to whether or not there was a conversation between the independent trustees of the charity and the family in the registration of these trademarks and whether that was all agreed. Because if that was all agreed and that the trademarks and the intellectual property was registered with the company and therefore the company would receive the sale profits from the books, then that is all fine. But that being the case, I feel that that should have been absolutely transparent from the start. Because as Piers Morgan quite rightly highlighted, um, even the Captain Sir Tom Moore Twitter account that you can see here, this is a tweet from May the 14th, 2020. So the same month that the charity was registered and the same month that these trademarks were registered. Um, his account, um, whether or not written by him, but his account wrote and tweeted 
I'm so looking forward to sharing my autobiography with you. So it was either written by him or it was ghostwritten. Um, I'd better get writing. The book will support the launch of the Captain Tom Foundation. More news on that to come. And if we move a little bit later still to July of that year, the 22nd of July 2020, delighted to reveal the cover of my children's book, 100 Steps, published by Puffin Books, in support of the creation of the Captain Tom Foundation. Um, so as you can see, all of those tweets and the headlines that were grabbing that I put in my video yesterday, you can see that most people, I believe, in my opinion, most people would have drawn the conclusion that these books were raising money for the charity. Now, it might well be the case that that was never the intention and that all of the money was going to the family business and that was understood by the charity and its independent trustees and it was understood by everybody, but potentially not by the general public. And I think that, as highlighted by Piers Morgan, is the biggest problem here. Those things that are not fully understood by the public do create these suspicions and raise these questions. And any questions in relation to any money always gets people upset. So just to round this off, in my opinion, if this is how it was all set up, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. If all of the book sales were supposed to go to the family and that was understood by everybody. But the bit that I do take an issue with is that, in my opinion, again, I don't think that the general public would have understood that. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe you'll let me know in the comments what you think. And some people already have and said that they assumed that the sale of the books was all going to the charity. Some people equally have said that they didn't think about where the money went. They bought the book because they were interested in his life and such a wonderful life and inspirational uh, life it was. So I think my closing thoughts on all of this are not to be overly critical, but at the same time, I do feel that there are questions left unanswered. So let me know your thoughts and comments below. Uh, if you found this, useful and interesting by way of a brief introduction to trademarks, intellectual property, and so on. Do hit that like button, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.